I'm Robert Jolly. I am a uh, project manager. I love WordPress. I love accessibility. I'm happy to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about ways that you can bring accessibility into your workflow. If you're a designer, a developer, a project manager, a client, uh, a QA person, um, if you wear all of those hats, then hopefully there's something in here for you. So what exactly is accessibility? I didn't really know uh, a few years ago. I, I was big into web standards, but I kind of got introduced into web accessibility through uh, a, another speaker. And um, you know, it always seems very complex. Uh, it seems like it's expensive. And do, does anybody else share that, that feeling, or have you had that feeling? Um, it doesn't have to be. It can be if you approach it in, in a way where accessibility isn't kind of baked into your process. So uh, what I'm going to attempt to do with this talk is just talk about ways that we actually make our sites work well for everyone, but we do it throughout the process. So just a little bit of background information. There are a billion people on this planet who have a disability of some kind or another. Some people have multiple disabilities. In the US, one in five people have a disability. So that's 20%. And if you uh, keep up with the market share on browser stats, 20% is actually higher than the number of, uh, than the percentage that Internet Explorer shares for all versions. I think it's in like 15 to 17% for all versions of Internet Explorer for browsers. So when you think about accessibility and people with disabilities, that's a very large number. And so with that large number comes a lot of dollars. So people with disabilities, they spend approximately $175 billion annually in the US. So I think I have the marketer's attention. And my slides are a little uh, wonky. I think, I think my format, the, the, the ratio is bad. But you get the message, right? Uh, you know, there's money to be had there. Um, there's money to be lost there, too. If you, uh, if you ignore accessibility and people with disabilities can't use your site, you open yourself up to lawsuits. And uh, you know, it's not just for people that that uh, that have long-term disabilities, uh, or or for people that are that are born into a disability. Uh, it's a group that anyone can join at any point. Uh, this is a this is a quote that gets thrown out a lot, but it's true. We're a heartbeat away from needing accessibility. This is a this is an MRI of my brain. Uh, four years ago, I had a stroke. Um, it affected my balance. It, um, it gave me uh, just debilitating headaches for about six weeks. And I was really lucky. I was pretty fit at the time. And my brain, uh, the, the blood vessels in my brain, they, they kind of remapped and, and worked around the issue in my cerebellum. But tomorrow is the fourth anniversary of my stroke. So um, you know, I was very close to really having significant issues. But for about six weeks, I really couldn't use the web the way that I was accustomed to. And then this year in March, I uh, have this great flattering picture of me up here. But uh, that was the day I had surgery with, uh, with holding my hand up. And uh, I had crashed my bike. And I dislocated my thumb, my mousing hand. And you know that's very important for me. But I couldn't use it. So I had to actually uh, transition to just using keyboard only. And so that's a picture of the therapy that I had to go through for about three months. So you know, disabilities are really, you know, it can happen at any time. There are, there are many, many different types of disabilities. I won't list them all. Um, but it, it goes beyond just making your site. Uh, accessibility goes beyond making your site uh, uh, friendly to screen readers. It's for people with low vision, people with, um, with uh, hearing loss or deafness, people with mobility issues, people with chronic pain, seizure disorders. There are just a myriad of, of different types of disabilities. So, that brings us to, you know, where, where do we start? Like this, this is, you know, it's a lot to take in. Don't do it at the end of the project. Don't leave accessibility towards the end because you'll get something like this. This is a doctor's office in Europe. And you can see the, the, the uh, accessible uh, ramp that goes up and kind of winds around. It's serpentine. I think there are diff nine different um, landing stages to that. And I'm sure that this meets spec in some way, some sort of 
um, some sort of disability uh, law spec about how, um, how this should be built, but it, it clearly was an afterthought, and I don't think many people would enjoy using this, except maybe skaters. And, uh, you know, that's, that's great, but, uh, but not so great for the people that really need it. So what do we do um, with, uh, with accessibility throughout the project? You know, I, I, can, I can preach to you that everyone on the project has a role, but let's, let's talk a little bit about what those roles are. Um, because you can spread the, uh, you can spread the load with, with the accessibility task work, and it becomes less expensive to fix accessibility issues that are left at the very end. So when you're planning a project, if you're a client, write it into your contract. Make it, make it a requirement for your vendors. So if, if, you, if you have a, a new website design project or redesign project coming up, just make sure that you, you, you spec out the guidelines. And then if you have the, uh, the ability to uh, afford some time and some money to test with real people with disabilities, that's the best thing you can do right there. Because you can meet the technical guidelines, but if it's not functionally accessible, then you, you still have problems. So always consider usability with uh, usability testing with people with disabilities. And then when you're on the vendor side of things, on the project management team, um, you want to map the accessibility guidelines to the tasks that your team members are going to be uh, undertaking. So there are things that you can do as a project manager, but there are things that your team, if you understand what the, what the accessibility uh, needs are for each different role, then you can, you can make a big difference. You want to communicate regularly with your team. Make sure that, you know, it's not just at the beginning of the project, but throughout the project that you're checking in and you're, you're saying, all right, how about accessibility? What are we doing to, to make sure that we're covering that? Don't just assume that your team is going to have it covered like you do. You want to establish a test plan. It can be formal or informal, but make sure that you have a test plan, a way that you can, at, at regular intervals, test for accessibility as, as you're going through the uh, design and development process. And then, uh, of course, represent accessibility at every stand-up. Every, every project check-in that you have, Make sure that you're at least talking about accessibility, making sure that you're, you're covering, covering your bases. So requirements often state very dryly in one line what accessibility guideline must, must be followed. Sometimes it's Section 508 of the Americans with Disability Act, but a lot lately it's the uh, World Wide Web Consortium's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That's WCAG, W-C-A-G. Um, the version 2.0 is the, is the latest that's out. So when that's stated, you're like, what? <laughs> I need to find out what that means, right? Or maybe you're not, and, and that, that leads to problems later on. But, um, so do your best to find out what that means. And if you go to print the guidelines, it's 34 pages long. This is, how, this is how accessibility gets kind of a bad rap. It's, it's very daunting, right? It's, there, there's just a lot more than just one line item. The good thing is, is that it can be broken down into, um, into four principles. Those principles are uh, perceivable, operable, um, understandable, and robust. The, uh, the acronym for that is POUR, P-O-U-R. And those four principles get broken down into 12 main guidelines and then 61 success criterion. And there are three different levels for those, uh, those criterion. So level A is kind of the baseline, and you really need to cover that. There are 25, um, 25 success criteria for that. At level double A, which is, uh, is what frequently is, is cited as you know, what, what sites need to have um, if you're a government site, or uh, in the case of airlines, I've been working with a couple recently the uh, Department of Transportation requires level A and double A. And then if you really want to level up, you go to level triple A. And, and that makes a really good experience for users. So some things that you can, you can think about if you're a project manager is don't worry about memorizing all of the guidelines. I don't know all of them by heart. I know some. I can recite a couple of them. 
and realize that it's that you know these are just guidelines and you can you can create a checklist mentality but that's imperfect at best so remember that the end user is your goal their experience so make sure that you're testing along the way and make sure that that uh, if you can perform usability testing or somehow get feedback from people with disabilities who are using your site, that's going to be great. Um, do understand the roles and duties of, uh, of accessibility based on the, the team that you have, what designers need to do, what developers need to do, what your QA team needs to do if you're working on a bigger team. Communicate frequently, add it to every phase. Incorporate testing with every sprint that, that, that you have and advocate for end users. There's, um, there's a uh, W3C accessibility responsibility breakdown and it's a fantastic resource. If you Google that or um, I'm not sure, in my slides there are probably, uh, there, there should be a link there, that's, that's supposed to be a link to take you to it, but the W3C has a great resource for learning you know, kind of what guidelines can be uh, mapped to which roles and, and what tasks can happen on a project. So with, uh, with content, you want to have images having appropriate um, alt text attributes. You want to caption your videos. That's another form of alternate text and provide transcripts for audio. You can provide transcripts for video as well, and you can do, also do audio description for your videos. Those things are really important for people with disabilities. It's also great SEO juice. Um, juice up the SEO there, uh, as I've heard mentioned here. Uh, you can also watch out for your reading level, so make sure that you're not using language that's too complex for people with cognitive uh, disabilities or challenges. You want to avoid any elements that are rapidly flashing. Um, anything that flashes more than three times per second is a potential um, seizure trigger. So, you know, people that that uh, that that have that uh, to deal with really, you know, don't need to to have a seizure triggered by your website. So, some guidelines, uh, some general guidelines for alt text is that every image needs the alt attribute. You don't always have to have it contain anything. So if you have a decorative image that really has no other meaning other than to just decorate the page, just give it empty, empty quotes. Not a space in the quotes, but just alt equals quote, quote. Um, that will actually inform screen readers to just skip over that, that content and just ignore it. Um, Along those lines with images, if you're using background images for anything that's important in, in terms of content, if it's conveying information or functionality, take it out of the background. Don't use background with CSS, background images, because you can't apply an alt attribute to a CSS background image. So basically, that's inaccessible to people with screen readers and also anyone with uh, Windows high contrast mode, those background images just disappear. So it's, it's you know, Bad things happen, basically, with that. When you're using alt text, keep it brief and on point. Make it descriptive, um, but you don't have to be overly verbose. And then if you have a functional image, uh, you might want to treat your alt text a little bit differently. So in the case of, uh, of header logos that, that point back to the home page as a link, you know, um, I really like the Waffle House. So this is actually their they're a little clip from their, their header. And they've got their, their Waffle House logo and the alt text is Waffle House. And that's, that's pretty good, they have alt text. They're using WordPress, they've got, they've got some things going on really, really well there. Uh, but a better alt text for that might be alt, uh, might be alt equals Waffle House home. Because that tells people that it's gonna, if they click on that link, it's gonna take them back to the home page. And that's a pretty, uh, you know, having that logo there, um, with a link is a pretty standard convention, but you can you can tell where you know other areas if there if it's a submit button that's that's an image you might want to have that alt text not just uh, you know not just be uh, the word itself but actually telling people what to expect in the alt text. So there are ways you can check your uh, your content's reading level. 
a quick way, um, uh, well, the general guideline is to aim for a, a reading level of around eight for general audiences. Uh, so it, like what an eighth grader might be able to read easily. And for the WordCamp US site, uh, you can actually go to readability-score.com uh, and you can plug in a URL and I plugged in WordCamp's uh, URL and it had a, a grade level of 8.6, which is, which is great. Uh, but there's an easy way to check that online. There's a, there are a few different tools. You can actually download some, some apps that will run. And I believe even in Word you can um, figure out what the, uh, what the readability score is. So when you get into design, your UI designers, UX designers need to be thinking about consistent interfaces for people, making sure that things are predictable and, and, uh, and understandable. Easy one is to always check color contrast. You know, when you're, when you're mocking things up, always check your color contrast. And, and there, you can make a beautiful design that is high, you know, high enough contrast to meet accessibility guidelines, but still looks great. You don't have to have everything be black and white. You want to be aware of line length issues. Just keep things readable. Um, you know, don't make it difficult for people with, with you know, line lengths that stretch all the way out when you're, you know, when you're on a big monitor. Um, and related to that, anything uh, related to proximity, so keeping related items close is going to be very important. So if you have a convention where you have your form set up and then uh, you've decided for your design standard that you're going to put your, your submit buttons all the way to the right on your, uh, on your form, well, on a larger screen, that might become a proximity issue where all the form fields are over here and then your right aligned, you know, at the bottom button is is kind of not related to the actual form itself. So that, that could be an accessibility issue. You always want to design for your focus state. So just like if you're, a, if you're doing design work and you're thinking about what happens when people hover, think about what happens when people have keyboard focus on there. So some people don't have a mouse. They can't use it, but they're, they're a sighted keyboard user. So when they're tabbing through the interface, make sure that your focus states are good um, in terms of clearly shown with either outlines or some sort of differentiation so that people will know as they're tabbing through your page where they are and what they can do, what, what links they're on. And then at the same time, design for your error states. For, so when you're submitting a form, don't always assume that everyone's going to have uh, the, the perfect form experience. They're going to always fill out your form correctly. So try to think about how, how you can gracefully handle an error situation when people, you know, enter the wrong thing and uh, they, they need to, you know, kind of go through that form again and, and, uh, and fix the errors. You know, take that, take that heavy lifting and do that for them and make it easier for people to, uh, to correct their mistakes. You'll find that uh, you'll have more conversions, you have more sales as a result. We'll talk about some tools for color contrast. So colorsafe.co is a great tool to use while you're, uh, while you're uh, determining your color palette. So you can plug in uh, a baseline color and then you can get other accessible color options. And uh, I believe that's a tool uh, that uh, was launched and provided by the uh, Salesforce UX team. And Lee Veru's contrast ratio, it's on GitHub. It does a similar thing where you can plug in values and see what the, uh, what the contrast ratio is. And there's also a, a, an app that you can download on Windows, Linux, uh, Mac called the Color Contrast Analyzer. And so if you're working in, in Photoshop, there may not be a tool for color contrast checking built into Photoshop, but you can easily do that here with this, uh, this Color Contrast Analyzer. And if you design in the browser, we've got that covered too. So Chrome's web accessibility uh, uh, developer tools allow you to easily check for things like color contrast. 10 minutes, okay, 10 minutes left. There's a lot to go through. Um, another thing that you can do as a designer is to, basically you can take your, your hand and, and make a tiny hole like a straw. And if, if you wanna do that now, you can actually look up at the screen and you can look through it and this simulates uh, low vision. So some people use uh, extreme zoom magnification or they just have pinhole vision and they can only see a small bit on the screen. So 
you can check your proximity of items and you can see whether there are problems. With this sp specific example with Virgin America, this is where they fly and I, I wanted to see where to go from Chicago, where I could go. And if you look closely, those, uh, those cities there have a book button that's all the way to the right, but with a two column layout, they look like they're associated with those other cities on the right. Uh, so that could be a, a proximity issue for people with low vision. So let's talk about ways you can uh, tackle accessibility with development. We want to develop with web standards in mind as much as possible. So if you can keep things semantic and, and, and coded in, in a standards compliant way, you're going to reap all of the accessibility benefits that the web, uh, that the promise of the web has. So, you know, treat buttons as buttons. Don't just do a div with JavaScript and and call that, you know, make that a class of a button because that won't be clickable and it won't be announced to people with assistive technologies. You want to set the page language. These are very basic things, but these are things that people forget. Give each page uh, a descriptive title, a unique title. So, you know, I talked about using semantics. Foreground images, please, everyone, and that you know, give them alt text. With WordPress, there's a built-in CSS class that you can hide informative text from uh, from visual users, but uh, but it gets read out for screen reader users. So it's just screen reader text. It's been built in for I don't know four or five years now. Uh, so that's a great way that you can basically give people more information that they wouldn't get. Uh, if they can't see the screen. So, you know, visual users have the context of, of what's on the screen. So, you know, like a read more link is fine for somebody that can see that it's associated with, that link is associated with the, the, the headline or the body copy. Uh, but uh, but if, you, if you're a screen reader user and you're going through with links mode, you just have a bunch of read more links that it gets, gets announced to you and you don't know what they're about. So you can hide that, uh, that additional copy there to help folks. And then if you uh, take a mobile first responsive design, uh, if, you, if you take that approach, that's going to help you reap a lot of benefits just built in for accessibility. One of the biggest things that you can do as a developer is just use your keyboard. Everything you make as a developer, everything that you build and code, every time you do a check-in or every time you save something locally, test it with your keyboard and see if you can access all of the links and all of the functionality with your keyboard. That's one of the biggest things that you can do before anything else. And then, of course, you know, look at, look at your, your error handling. You know, give people a great experience with, with good uh, form, form error handling. Uh, there's a forms example at Simply Accessible. Uh, I think it's examples.simplyaccessible.com. They have a ton of great, uh, great examples of how you can make forms more accessible. You can unit test with tools like Quail. And there's a plugin uh, called Access Monitor. Joe Dolson has, uh, has written this plugin. And basically, you can, you can test the accessibility of your, of your posts uh, against the uh, Tenon API and, uh, and find out if if it passes certain accessibility tests. And it won't let you actually publish the post. You can set that up where it actually prevents you from publishing until you fix the errors. So that's a, a fantastic thing you can do. So you know, definitely employ unit testing. But above all else, use the keyboard. Uh, after that, you can level up to screen readers. But when you, when you tackle keyboard accessibility, you, make, you lay that foundation for, uh, for your screen reader users as well. So I'm going to run through very quickly accessibility plugins and themes, and uh, and then we'll get to hopefully a couple of questions. Uh, so the theme directory has the accessibility ready tag. There are 79 uh, themes right now in the theme directory at WordPress.org that are t are have been reviewed for accessibility and uh, and have have uh, have have gotten published out there. That's not a lot compared to the, the uh, overall number. So my challenge to you as, as theme developers and authors is to, is to increase that number. Use the, use the techniques that you're learning here today and, and, and uh, with other information that you have out there, go and, and make more themes uh, accessibility ready. That's, that's really a, you know, what we need in the community. 
there's a plugin called WP Accessibility, also by the venerable Joe Dolson. Um, this helps to patch themes as well as adds a few uh, a few additional features for accessibility to WordPress. Uh, we this is a great this is a great plugin. I use it, but if our themes are accessible and our plugins are accessible, we don't need tools. We don't need other plugins to patch these things. There's a if you use Genesis, there's a Genesis accessible plugin to help get you through. If you use Gravity Forms, or Contact Form Seven, there are plugins for those for accessibility. But really, we should be baking these things into our plugins and themes. So um, that's my challenge for uh, the, the plugin and theme authors out there: is to to really level up and and uh, and and make things accessibility ready. I've said that. I want to repeat it. We should not need to fix themes and plugins with other plugins. So uh, let's let's try to you know build it into the core of what we're doing. And that's about it. Uh, I I really love this community. I love WordPress. I love accessibility. If you've got any questions, there may be a couple of minutes. I'm happy to happy to help. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the, uh, for the talk, it was fabulous. Um, JavaScript is a big point of contention and accessibility. Uh, since 4.2 in WordPress is actually a wp.a11y dot class in JavaScript, which is very powerful, and one of them is the dot speak method, which is very, very useful. You, uh, uh, you probably want to talk about that at some point. Uh, on the theme things, uh, there are only 79 themes at the moment that are accessible, but that went up from 17 last year. So it's a pretty huge bump, and there are tremendous efforts being done on that front as well. Definitely, yes, yes. Um, and I do want to commend the entire WordPress community on making accessibility you know, part of the core. Um, a very important part of the core. And even at the conference, we have captions, live captions for, for each session. I don't know of many, if any, conferences that do that unless they're accessibility focused. So um, big kudos to, uh, to the WordPress community for this. Hey, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, Thank quick you. question about uh, there was a WordPress, WordPress default class that you mentioned, like screen reader text, I think it was. Um, so could you, I'm just try, having trouble uh, understanding that. So that one hides text for screen readers, is that right? Right. It, so it visually hides content, and it doesn't have to be just text, but you can visually hide some content from screen readers, uh, I mean from visual users, from so, visual. That, um, so that it can be read out to screen readers. So uh, one thing that, uh, that, like with read more text, so you have a read more link, when, uh, when screen reader users are going through a links, uh, browsing just by, by the links on the page, so there are many different ways. You can browse by uh, header levels or, uh, or by links or just go through the content linearly. But if you're using that links browsing, you get a bunch of read more links without any context about what it is. So with screen reader text, you can actually put the title of your post, so read more, and then have a span class uh, screen reader text with the title of your post in there, so you don't have that visually for people that that have the context of that the read more is is associated with that copy that's right above it, but you have that there for the uh, the actual uh, screen reader user, so it gets read out to them in the context of that link. Thank you. Is there a class that does the the opposite, so it would hide it visually but only read it out on screen readers? Does that make sense? Oh, that's 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 what that is. So, so I meant the opposite of that. I'm sorry. The opposite of that. Um, so Why would you want to do that? Only be visible, but not. I'm, I'm just curious. Well, uh, so you can. Yeah, I don't know that you would necessarily want to 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 own, to show certain pieces of content for people that can see, but people that can't, uh, you would hide it from them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this was great. I love this. Um, it seems like a lot of people are giving advice about accessibility all the time, some of which I suspect is misguided or unsubstantiated. Is there any, um, are there any things that you ever see or any like advice given that you just like think is completely wrong or things about mis accessibility that are, that have just um, over the years like, I don't know, just like false information or like bad tips that you've come across? Well, uh, 
I think so, yes. Um, I, I want to say that, that often people's intentions are good when they want to make things accessible. Uh, one, one thing that I've seen happen a lot uh, is that, that uh, designers and developers sometimes think that the title text will make things accessible. They, they, they use title text all over the place instead of alt text. And, uh, and so the title attribute really, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't behave the same with all types of assistive technology. So that's one of the things that the WordPress community kind of fixed is that title text would always go in as kind of the default thing that, that, that would be a description of an image or a media item. And, um, and you know, that's, that's starting to, to kind of go away where title text is not a, is not a great alternative text. There are certain ways you, you can use it, but it's, it's much more limited than people think that it is. Um, but I think in general, um, most of the advice that, that's coming out is, is probably, it, it's coming from a good place. Um, and uh, I, I can't think of anything that is, you know, I can't think of anything that I've heard at WordCamp with the four set different talks th that have been happening that has been just dead wrong. Somebody may disagree and somebody may say, man, you are so wrong, Robert. But uh, <laughs> let me know if that's the case. All right, thanks. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, don't use CSS background elements. Uh, what if they are purely decorative? Is that, use them. Is use them for that. If they're purely decorative, use them for that. But if they, if it's for actual content, um, information, or functionality, that's important for people to grasp. Um, you know, sighted users will have no no problem with it as long as they have CSS on, which most people do. But um, but folks with uh, either high contrast mode on in Windows or um, screen screen reader users will just miss that completely. So it's it's really for um, functional content, uh, informational and functional content that's important. You don't want to trap it in background images. Gotcha. The other question is about, uh, I've noticed that there are a couple of, there are a, a small number of Gulp and Grunt uh, plugins for A11Y and, and a couple other different accessibility checkers, but I'm not sure that they're actually relevant for WordPress generated pages and sites since it looks like they're basically designed to check HTML pages and pre-rendered pre HTML, so I'm not sure that, that actually helps during the production. Well, uh, so the the Access Monitor plugin that hooks in with Tenon, uh, and you can use Tenon directly too without using Access Monitor, but Access Monitor is is a plugin that you can actually you know check your your post content that runs against the 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 rendered DOM uh, it, that for the HTML. So that uh, you know it basically is like a headless browser. So it it experiences it just like any other web browser would. So. Um, you know, so so some of those, and I think Quail does the same thing. So some of those are actually do check it as if it's a rendered uh, page, and that's what you want because really accessibility is all about what that front end code, um, how it gets rendered in the browser. Do you know anything that would actually help with the the checking kind of during the build process, during the development of of a theme, for instance, uh, before it's rendered? That I'm trying. I don't know if that makes sense even, but. Uh, I'm trying to to build themes that are that are already are, already have accessibility built in, so that uh, they're ready to go without you know, kind of doing unit testing sort of along the way for accessibility. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think I think Quail is a good one for it, and Tenon. If you're working locally, you can you can actually you know kind of bake that in. You can you can use the API to send the chunks of of what that is as you're developing it, so it doesn't have to be live on the internet. To, to be able to, to access that services. And I think I, I'm being told I have to cut this off, but if you have questions, Thank I'm you. gonna step right outside this room and I can talk with anyone about anything um, accessibility related or if you, if you love Waffle House, tell me about that. Thank you.